In this lesson, what I want to do is talk about the second of these great alliance structures that existed within pre-World War I Europe. And this is looking at uh, specifically the Triple Entente, which included Britain, France and the Russian Empire. So the last lesson, what we did was we outlined the first side of this, uh, these great European powers at the outbreak of the First World War. We looked at the Central Powers or the, or the Triple Alliance system. Um, this lesson is going to be a bit different. We're going to talk about the other side of the conflict, essentially. This is the alliance that will become known as the Triple Entente. And I think you should really take note of the thing that I said at the end of the last lesson, which is that on paper, the idea of having an alliance system uh, to uh, essentially have a system whereby if one country is attacked, then the rest of the countries can get involved and enter the conflict along on their side. That that on paper is a very good idea, except for instances where we have two great alliance systems that could potentially lead to global conflict, which is what happened with the First World War. So the Triple Entente would compose three European powers, Great Britain, France and Russia. These are all empires. So technically we're talking about the British Empire, the French Empire and the Russian Empire. But I'm going to use these terms interchangeably. I'm going to interchange France and French Empire. They mean the same thing when I make that reference. So Great Britain had spent the majority of the 1800s in actually a state of isolationism when it comes to European politics. They decided to stay away from European politics for the majority of the 1800s. That's what isolationism refers to, the idea that a country isolates themselves from the rest of the sort of international politics that existed. So another example of isolationism took place in America in the 1920s. They they cut themselves off from a lot of the a uh, lot of all the international politics that took place. In Britain, this became known as the splendid isolation. So isolationism tends to be a policy that is often met with quite a lot of positivity among the people of that particular country, because there is often this idea that why should we as Britain or America or whatever country we're talking about, why should we be getting involved in European conflict or European politics or world issues that take place? It should just be for them to deal with themselves. That's why isolationism is generally something that is um, seen as quite positive among, among states. So this is why we call it the splendid isolation of the 1800s. Now, the main reason for isolationism within this particular context relates to the nature of the British Empire, as well as the attitudes towards the British Empire. And Britain had a very interesting and very independent, unique role when it came to its relationship with the rest of Europe. And it always had this, uh, it has this, uh, this, this distinct relationship with the rest of Europe, mainly because it is not something that is, it's not a part of the European mainland in any, in any meaningful sense. And there are other reasons for this as well, due to the, the unique history of Britain as being one that has been sent quite devoid of, of revolution and, and turmoil compared to other countries in, in the rest of Europe. And so therefore we see that Europe, Britain has a very different relationship to Europe than other countries within Europe has. But at the turn of the century, we will see this policy change. We will see an end to this concept of, of a splendid isolation. In fact, what will happen is um, Britain will have greater alliances with France. And the reason for this is uh, the result of a number of agreements that is made when it comes to colonies in Africa. So towards the middle part of the 1800s, the 1850s and onwards, we start to see a, a, a shift take place in terms of colonialism, in terms of empires taking further territories, we see a shift away from the Americas and a move towards uh, Africa. This is known as the scramble for Africa. And if you're somebody who is taking A-level history, you might um, be for, you might take this um, topic if you do the British Empire module for A-level history. You might become more familiar with that in the future. But that is what happens in the second half of the 1800s. Britain was also less concerned about the Russian Empire since they had lost in 1904 to a conflict against Japan. This was the Russo-Japanese War. And so as a result, there is less concern about any kind of conflict with Russia. Russia and Britain had a relatively cordial relationship over the majority of its history when Russia was an imperial state. So from 1725 at the ascension, uh, or sorry, at the death of Peter the Great of, of Russia, uh, the Tsar, uh, moving into all the way up to the end of the Romanov dynasty in Russia uh, in 1918. 
Britain had a general cordial relationship with Russia, except for a number of uh, 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 major incidents where uh, their relationship was uh, not particularly uh, cordial. So um, there are particular conflicts, for example, Crimean War uh, is an example of such a conflict. But for the most part, they were relatively cordial. And there was therefore less concerned about Russia as a threat due to the fact that Russia were defeated definitively by Japan in 1904. And so as a result of all of these different factors, Britain becomes very concerned and mainly concerned about the naval ambitions of Germany. And so this is really where we start to see the Triple Entente begin to form. France had the greatest tensions with Germany at the turn of the century um, for a number of reasons why this was the case. They had been defeated in a conflict against Germany in 1870. We, we've mentioned this already um, in the last lesson where we see the unification of Germany in 1871. The German Kaiser was also keen to build up a very strong military and industrial force within Germany, something that would obviously concern the neighbour of that particular country that was at war with them in the 1870s, namely the neighbour being France themselves. And as a result of all of these different factors, France began to build up a military of their own and began to build up a, uh, an industry alongside Germany to try and compete with Germany in any meaningful sense. On top of this, we also see France begin to establish alliances on the other side of Germany with Russia. So Russia and, uh, and France, we'll talk about Russia in a second, and begin to ally themselves together against Germany uh, as a way to try and protect themselves against Germany and against any kind of aggression from the German Empire. Military alliances will be established between France and Russia as early as 1892, so a tiny little bit before we begin our major and period of study. But we start to see uh, from eight, from 1892 a a, a beginning of of. of of alliances begin to take shape as the two uh, systems of alliances begin to form, the Triple Entente as well as the Central Powers. Finally, Russia, while being far by far the largest of the European powers, as you geographically it had the most territory, it was also at the turn of the century the least industrially developed. Most of the Russian economy would rely on agriculture, and this would begin to change a little bit after the First World War, and we start to see the Russian Revolution, and we see actually a, a great amount of industrialization under Stalin with his five-year plans, but before the First World War, there is a very strong reliance on agriculture. Russia, in terms of its culture and its terms of its development, almost develops uh, like a hundred years behind the rest of Europe. It's very interesting, if you uh, ever are interested, to make comparisons between art and architecture that is um, that is created in Russia compared to created in Britain or France around the same time. Art is very interesting because it's almost like um, around the time of Henry VIII, for example, we see um, a certain artistic style begin to take place within Western Europe in terms of the sort of Enlightenment and beginning into the, uh, not Enlightenment, sorry, the, the Renaissance um, period of, of, art, of art and uh, an art of culture. If you then compare that to paintings and artists that are created uh, at the exact same time, but in Russia, they still seem to be uh, like 100 years behind. And so the best way to do this is if you want to ever com make a, a comparison between an artist's rendition of Ivan the Fourth, Ivan the Terrible, and Henry the Eighth, who, who, who were around and uh, reigned around the same time as each other, you can see the distinction between the, uh, between the different artistic styles and how far behind Russia tends to be uh, when it came to the rest of the western europe that's quite an interesting thing that you could you could do in your spare time but it gives you a general idea of the kind of both cultural uh, distinction between western europe and eastern europe as well as the um, economic and political systems that existed russia was still a very agricultural country Russia also had to deal with a number of tense relations with their neighbours as well. So they had to worry and deal with the growing power of Germany, as we would understand. But as well as this, the um, the growing tensions that existed with Austria-Hungary. Because of the fact that Austria-Hungary was um, very much in tense relations with other Eastern European Slavic states like Serbia, and because Russia aligned themselves with the uh, Eastern European Slavic states such as Serbia, we start to see um, more and more tensions grow in that region as well. So Serbia and Russia had a very close relationship and Serbia had a tense relationship with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as I mentioned. And so we start to see these are the three major powers that we see within the Triple Entente. Let's talk about the establishment of the Triple Entente itself. 
So the establishment takes place in the early 1900s. All three of these European powers would establish a number of alliances with each other. So Britain and France will sign a cooperative agreement in 1904 uh, when it comes to an alliance between these two. Britain and Russia would then sign an agreement in 1907, uh, signifying a certain amount of alliance. And while these agreements did not specifically mandate that Great Britain would come to the aid of the powers of France and Russia in the event of a particular um, conflict, it was generally seen that this is a likely commitment that was going to take place. So while it was not explicit in the sense that it was explicit with the central powers, um, it was still something that was likely the, the case if that was to ever happen. Now, in reality, the reason for Britain entering into the First World War uh, on the side of France and Russia was actually due to an ultimatum um, relating to Belgium. So Belgium would be a, a neutral state during the First World War, but uh, Germany would... Uh, actually uh, Germany would essentially uh, ignore any kind of semblance of neutrality of Belgium and Britain would enter the war on that, on, along that basis instead so but in if that even if that hadn't have happened it is uh, incredibly likely that um, given the fact that these are alliances that begin to take shape in 1904 and 1907 that Britain would have probably entered the war eventually on the side of Russia and France uh, at some point within 1914. 